It's my pleasure to welcome you to the annual Stander Symposium Address. This evening's talk is a collaboration between the Stander Symposium and the University of Dayton Speaker Series. It is the annual Stander Address and it is the final uh, event in the first year of our new UD Speaker Series. As chair of that series, it's my honor to welcome you as we gather to hear from a world-renowned scientist, activist, educator, and broadcaster, and to stretch our own thinking about the issues of our day. We hope that you will open yourself, yourselves to learn, to think, and to question tonight. And perhaps, I hope to see the world differently, even if just a little, as you leave the RecPlex at the end of this evening. Uh, it is an absolute privilege for me to be able to introduce to you Dr. David Suzuki tonight. Uh, David Suzuki is a third generation Canadian. His grandparents immigrated as boat builders from Japan to the west coast of Canada and his family has lived in Vancouver ever since. His parents were born in Vancouver as was he. At age six, he and his family were sent to an internment camp in the Slocan Valley in British Columbia. And so David's formal schooling was postponed by a couple of years as he suffered severe infringement of his civil rights, as he suffered uh, a sense of exclusion by his Japanese fellows because he didn't speak Japanese in the camp, um, even as when he left there he recognized the racism and persecution he felt as a Japanese American. But in those two years, he was in a beautiful place, naturally speaking. And the Slocan Valley was his school and his playground. Um, and he indulged his fascination for bugs and critter, critters and creatures. Uh, and eventually went on to become educated did his bachelor's degree at Amherst College in the United States. He went to Amherst as a pre-med student. Um, and so I wanted to tell this little bit of his story because uh, I always like to share with our students the experiences of really accomplished and interesting people whose paths have not been exactly what they or their parents planned. I've had many, I'm also the chair of the English department, and I've had many a student in my office say at the end of their sophomore year, well, I really love English and I really wanted to do this, but I thought I should do something practical. Um, and then I tell them all the practical things they can do with an English major. But David was gonna be a doctor, and his mother wanted him to be a doctor, I think. Um, but in the course of his pre-med studies at Amherst, he took a course on genetics, and it changed his life. It opened up to him a whole new world of study, of learning, a way of seeing the natural world around him. And so he didn't go to med school. He went on to do a PhD in zoology at the University of Chicago, which he earned in 1961. He began teaching in Canada, first at the University of Alberta, and then uh, for many, many years, beginning in 1963, at my alma mater, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. He is now Professor Emeritus there, which means he's retired and he's honored and <laughs> all of that. Uh, I want to rehearse briefly for you some of his honors. In 1972, he was awarded the EWR CC Memorial Fellowship for Outstanding Research Scientist in Canada under the age of 35 and held that for three years. He's won numerous academic awards and holds 25 honorary degrees in Canada, the US, and Australia. He's been elected to the Royal Society of Canada and is a, compa and an, is a companion of the Order of Canada. And I can tell you those are really big deals. He has written 52 books, including 19 books for children, his 1976 textbook, An Introduction to Genetic Analysis with AJF Griffiths, remains the most widely used genetics textbook in the US and has been translated into seven other languages. He has received uh, great accolades for his lifetime work as a broadcaster. Uh, he began in television and radio uh, in the um, early 70s. 
He hosted uh, a, a science show called Quirks and Quarks on CBC Radio, which is the national uh, radio um, broadcasting network in Canada. He uh, began his television career in 1971, hosting a show called Suzuki on Science, which I grew up as a young child watching. He was the host of Science Magazine for several years. He has created, written, and hosted innumerable TV specials and uh, film documentaries about science and the natural world. He hosted uh, for many years the award-winning documentary The Nature of Things with David Suzuki. He won four Gemini Awards, which are kind of like the Canadian Emmys, as best host of different Canadian television series. Uh, and he has won an award from the United Nations for a series he did on, called A Planet for the Taking. And in June 2002, he received the John Draney Award for Broadcasting Excellence. In his work uh, for sustainable ecology and environmentalism, he has received UNESCO's Kalinga Prize for Science, the United Nations Environmental Medal Pro uh, Program Medal, UNEP's Global 500, and in 2009, he won the Right Livelihood Award, considered by some to be the alternative Nobel Prize. It is my great pleasure to be here to welcome Dr. David Suzuki to the podium. He is one of my lifetime idols, and he brings to his work as a public intellectual scientist and activist his passion for justice and a better world. Join me in welcoming him tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that overly generous uh, introduction. I'm delighted to be here today and uh, to be a part of this wonderful uh, lecture series. I hope you, it has a long and uh, distinguished life. It certainly had a good kickoff this year. So thank you for the opportunity to share a few of my ideas with you. I chose the subtitle of my talk today very deliberately setting the real bottom line because in speaking to politicians and business people I'm often told listen Suzuki you better be realistic about this the bottom line is the economy and as a biologist this never made any sense to me and now when the best science indicates that we are at an absolutely critical moment in human history I believe we have to focus on what the real bottom line is and then get on with dealing with that. Scientists identify Earth's geological uh, history in different epochs, you know, the Eocene, the Miocene, the Holocene, and, and all of those scenes. And now the Nobel Prize winner Paul Kurtzen has said that we have entered a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, the age when human beings have become a geological force. Our species, in fact, has become a new kind of force on this planet. In the four billion years that life has existed on Earth, there was never a single species of vertebrate that has numbered with a population of a billion individuals. There was never a vertebrate with that high a number. We reached that time, that number, in the early 1800s, and now we are seven times that number. This is absolutely without precedent, and this defies a general principle in biology that the population that a species achieves is inversely related to its size. In other words, the bigger you are, the the fewer of your type there can be. If you are uh, a, a redwood tree or an elephant or a whale, Obviously, you need much more space and resources to survive than if you were a mouse or a rabbit or a rat. So your population maximum is inversely related to size. Human beings are between redwoods and mice. We're a medium-sized species, but we are at an unprecedented number. And of course, we've done that through trade and technology. But that means that just the act of living means that we have a big ecological footprint. Every one of us has to breathe air. 
We have to drink water, eat food, clothe and shelter ourselves. So just the act of living with seven billion people means it takes a lot of air, water and land to support our species. But of course we're not like rabbits or rats or mice. We have an enormous amount of technology that is used on our behalf. I mean, looking here today, I am sure that none of you here has a big cotton field growing in your backyard to get the material you need to, to make your cotton shirts, and you, none of you has a flock of sheep to give you the wool, woolen uh, stuff that you've got. That is delivered to us thanks to technology, and then you consider the cars and the TVs and all of the stuff that we take for granted, your cell phones and computers, all of that technology amplifies our e ecological footprint because all of that stuff comes out of the earth. And when we're finished with them, we throw them back in to the earth. And so now our ecological footprint through technology has been amplified many, many fold. But it doesn't end there. Ever since World War II, we've been afflicted with an incredible appetite for stuff. The average American uh, teenager, teenage girl, sorry, is uh, estimated or is said to consider shopping their number one recreation. So not only do we like to shop, but we consider it the form of exercise that we get. We are consummate consumers. It's not an accident or a joke when Mr. Bush was president after 9-11, his first speech made to the American people included the, the uh, uh, urging to go out and shop. That wasn't a joke. Consumption is built into our economy. It's what keeps our economy going and that all amplifies again our ecological footprint. And we have a global economy that now uses the entire planet as a source of raw materials, the entire planet as a dumping ground for our toxic waste. And so when you add that all up together, our numbers, our technology, our consumption, and our global economy, we have become a new kind of force on the planet. We are now altering the physical, chemical, and biological properties of the planet on a geological scale. It wasn't very long ago that we referred to tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, drought, indeed volcanoes and earthquakes, as natural disasters or acts of God. Well, those things, those phenomena are no longer natural and they're no longer acts of God. We have actually become a part of what is going on in these events. We have taken, we have stepped up to be with the gods without God's knowledge of how to manage the, uh, the impact of what we are doing. How did we get to this point in our very brief history on this planet? I'm a geneticist, a biologist, and I tend to think in evolutionary terms. And one of the remarkable things that scientists have done with DNA is to use DNA to track the movement of human beings across the planet. And all of the tracks lead back to Africa 150,000 years ago. I can't wait for the Ku Klux Klan to invite me to give a speech and I tell these pointy-headed characters, we're all Africans for heaven's sakes, that's where we were born. We, uh, and I want you to imagine the world 150,000 years ago when our species appeared on Earth. There were still woolly mammoths on the planet. There were still saber-toothed tigers. It was a very different world. And the Serengeti Plains must have been filled with mammals in abundance and variety beyond anything that we would ever see today. And so if you think, if we went back in time to see the appearance of our species, you'd see these plains covered with amazing animals. And here and there, little clumps of three, four, or five of these funny-looking two-legged furless apes. And that was us. And I'm sure 150,000 years ago, no other species, when they saw us, they went, oh, watch out for those creatures. I mean, they're going to take over the planet. I mean, what did we have going for us? There weren't very many of us. We weren't very big. We weren't very fast or strong. And we weren't endowed with special sensory ability. I mean, really, what the heck did we have going for us? Well, of course, the secret to our success 
was invisible. It was a two kilogram organ buried deep in our skulls. It was a human brain that was a secret to our success. It endowed us with a massive memory. It gave us a, an insatiable curiosity and a very impressive creativity or inventiveness. And those qualities more than compensated for our lack of physical or sensory ability. That human brain drew the world together, created order out of chaos, and imagined uh, what the world was. That brain invented a concept called the future. The future doesn't exist. The only thing that exists is now and our memories of what happened in the past. But because we invented the concept of a future, we are the only animal that was able to recognize that we could affect the future by what we do today. We recognized if we apply what we have learned and, and, and uh, what we know, and we can see where there's opportunity and where there are dangers in the future. And we could deliberately choose now to avoid danger and exploit opportunities. I believe foresight, that ability to look ahead, was the key to our enormous success and that brought us in only 150 millennia, it brought us to where we now dominate the entire planet. We have invaded every continent on Earth, and we have become the dominant creature. And now, using that ability of foresight, the leading scientists of the world for some 40 years have been looking ahead and seeing where the dangers lie, seeing where opportunities are and been er warning us to avoid the dangers and exploit the opportunities. I want to just give you an example of, of some of that warning. This is a remarkable do document that came out I'm going to need it um, <coughs> that came out in 1992. It's called World Scientists Warning to Humanity. And it was signed by, um, how many are there? 1,700 scientists. These are not second or third rate scientists. These are the top scientists of the world. It's signed by 104 Nobel Prize winners. That was over half of all living Nobel Prize winners at the time. So what were the world scientists warning humanity about? Let me read some of it, just very little of it. Human beings and the natural world are on a collision course. Human activities inflict harsh and often irreversible damage on the environment and on critical resources. If not checked, many of our current practices put at serious risk the future that we wish for human society and may so alter the living world that it will be unable to support life in the manner that we know. Fundamental changes are urgent if we are to avoid the collision our present course will bring about. Pretty strong words, pretty unusual to come from a group of such eminent scientists. And then they go on and list the areas where the collision is taking place. The atmosphere, water resources, oceans, soil, forests, living species, and population. And then the words grow even more bleak. No more than one or a few decades remain before the chance to avert the threats we now confront will be lost and the prospects for humanity immeasurably diminished. This came out 20 years ago. We, the undersigned senior members of the world scientific community, hereby warn all humanity of what lies ahead. A great change in our stewardship of the earth and life on it is required if vast human misery is to be avoided and our global home on this planet is not to be irretrievably mutilated. And then they go on and list the five urgent things that have to be done immediately. This is a terrifying document. But I'll tell you what is even more frightening was the response of the media. There was no response. It was just one of those things that appeared and disappeared. Maybe a few things would have covered it. In our national newspaper, it appeared on page 10, I think, of our national newspaper. It was a, a one-day wonder. Foresight 
as illustrated by this scientific warning, was the great strategy that got our species to where we are. And yet, when we marshal all of that knowledge and all of the information and fed into super supercomputers and come out with conclusions to call for urgent action, we now turn our backs on foresight. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the beginning of the environmental movement. In 1962, Rachel Carson published a book called Silent Spring. And if you haven't read it, please put it on your list of books that must be read. I've read it many times. It remains, tragically, every bit as relevant today as it was 50 years ago when it came out. As I read that book, I was just beginning my career as a scientist. And reading Rachel Carson's book was all about the effects of pesticides, but especially DDT. And the message that I read into the book was, you scientists are clever. Yes, you can invent, create chemicals like DDT and show that it kills insects. But you don't understand that the lab or a growth chamber is not the real world. In the real world, everything is connected to everything else. The lab can never duplicate the conditions of the real world where it rains and the wind blows and insects move and, and uh, uh, drought happens and floods happen and all kinds of things happen. And so because of that lack of ability to predict, no one understood the real impact of the use of DDT in the, in the real world. And because of Rachel Carson's book, I and literally millions of other people were swept up in the modern environmental movement. In 1962, when her book came out, there wasn't a single department or ministry of the environment in any government on the planet. The word environment in 1962 simply didn't mean what it has come to mean today. But I was swept up in it, and uh, uh, in British Columbia, there was no shortage of, of uh, uh, issues to get involved in. I was involved in issues of clear-cut logging on the West Coast, uh, uh, drilling for oil off Hecate Strait, a very, uh, a very uh, dangerous area. We stopped that. A dam was to be built on the Peace River. We stopped that. Uh, we were fighting pollution from factories. And one of the early I issues was the American plan to test underground nuclear weapons in Amchitka in the Aleutian Islands off Alaska. And we were worried that it might set off tsunamis, that there might be a venting of radioactive material into the air and so on. And uh, Americans didn't, were no different then than they are now. They didn't give a damn what Canadians thought. Uh, they went and blew them, up, blew them up anyway. But one of the results was that Greenpeace was born in Vancouver. Greenpeace, I'm very proud to say, was a made in Canada organization as a result of that. The prob as I was swept up in the environmental movement, I thought the problem was that human beings were taking too much material, law, trees and fish and everything from the environment, and putting too much waste and toxic chemicals back into it. So in the way that I was thinking, the solution was we need departments of the environment, we need laws to regulate and protect clean water, clean air, the soil and the endangered species, and to, to enforce those regulations. But by the early 1970s, I realized that was stupid. It can't work that way. The reason it can't work is we don't know enough to regulate new technologies that come in. When DDT began to be used by in millions and millions of pounds, no one knew that there was an, a phenomenon called biomagnification, where you spray at low concentrations, DDT is consumed by microorganisms, and they're eaten by bigger organisms, and at each level up the food chain, you concentrate it. So by the time you get to the breasts of women and the shell glands of birds, you've concentrated DDT hundreds of thousands of times. We didn't know of the phenomenon of biomagnification because it was only discovered when eagles began to disappear in the United States, and biologists tracked it down and discovered the phenomenon of biomagnification. How could we regulate DDT if we didn't even know there was a thing called biomagnification? When the nuclear bombs were dropped over Hiroshima and Japan, 
We didn't know there was a thing called radioactive fallout. That was discovered years later in the test, uh, atom tests over bikini. We didn't know about electromagnetic pulses of gamma rays that knock out electrical circuits or nuclear winter. When CFCs were used, no one had any idea that CFCs would persist, drift higher in the air, and high up above Earth, an ultraviolet light would break chlorine free radicals off CFCs and that chlorines would scavenge ozone. When scientists began to say CFCs are destroying the ozone layer, my reaction was, I didn't know there was an ozone layer up there to destroy. How could we have managed CFCs? We didn't know that could happen. And believe me, we are going to find exactly the same thing with genetically modified organisms, which I know are growing in abundance now in the state of Ohio. And guess what? You're performing a massive experiment. We have no idea what the effect of genetically modified organisms will be. I have absolutely no question we're going to discover uh, things that we couldn't have anticipated beforehand. You're carrying out the experiment for us. Thank you very much. We'll learn from you what some of the unexpected effects uh, are. But for me, in the growing area of environmentalism, I was really stymied. How could we manage these powerful technologies? We need technology, but how could we manage technologies when we knew so little about what their impact would be in our surroundings? And a very big change in the way I saw the problem happened in the late 1970s when I began, uh, well, I started by, uh, I decided to do a film on the battle over logging in what was then called the Queen Charlotte Islands. These are the uh, island archipelago, this is the arch island archipelago coming off the Alaskan panhandle. And this is our northernmost uh, island chain in uh, northwestern British Columbia. And for years, a battle had been raging between environmentalists and Haida, the native people, against uh, forest industry and uh, the government. So I decided to do a show about the battle over logging and went up to Haida Gwaii, the, uh, the islands, and I interviewed uh, forest company executives, loggers, interviewed politicians, environmentalists. And one of the people I interviewed was a Haida, um, First Nations person who had led the battle. Now, I knew the Haida were desperate for jobs, that uh, they had a high level of unemployment, they needed economic development, and many of the loggers were Haida. And many of the non-Haida loggers would come to their communities and shop in their stores. So I knew that, that logging was bringing economic, uh, some kind of economic uh, um, improvement in the Haida community. So I said to Gu Zhao, this young Haida um, um, artist, why are you opposing the logging? What difference does it make if the trees are cut down? And he said, well, I guess then we'll be like everybody else. And at the time he said it, I didn't know, have a clue what the hell he meant until I began to reflect on it and realized what he had done was open a window on a radically different way of seeing the world. He was telling me that to the Haida, they don't see themselves as ending at their skin or their fingertips. To be Haida means to be connected to the land in a profound way. That the trees, the birds, the air, the water, the fish, all of that was what make the Haida who they are. They are a part of that, that area. And you destroy a part of that and you destroy a part of what the Haida are will then be like everybody else. And I realized that the, the culture, the history, the very meaning of why Haida are on this planet is dictated to them by their connection to the land. And I realized then that environmentalists had framed the problem the wrong way. There's no environment out there and we have to regulate our interaction with it. We are the environment. There is no separation from that. And all around the world, I've been learning from Aboriginal people, and everywhere it's the same. They refer to the earth as our mother. And I used to say, oh yeah, that's a good image to get, and they'd say, stop patronizing us. We don't mean this metaphorically or uh, uh, poetically. We mean it literally, that the earth is what gives us birth because 
We are created out of the four sacred elements, earth, air, fire, and water. It's taken me a while to really fully understand that, but I see as a scientist that science corroborates everything that they tell us in terms of that relationship with the earth. So let me show you what I mean. The minute every one of us left our mother's body, the very first thing that we needed was a breath of air. That breath was to inflate our lungs and to announce that we had arrived on this planet. And from that time on to the last breath we take before we die, we need air every minute of our lives. And we don't even think about it. So I want you just for the next couple of minutes to think about that breath of air. That's it. Two to four liters of air deep down into the most intimate, moist, warm part of my body, my lungs. And if you've ever seen a, a fresh set of lungs and touched it, it's kind of ooh, yucky, squishy, mushy, because lungs are mostly made of air. Our lungs have an average of 350 million alveoli. These are little capsules that are clustered like grapes around an alveolar duct. We have 350 million of them to give the surface area to come into contact with the air. If we flattened the alveoli out in two dimensions, they would, a single pair of lungs would cover a tennis court. So that's how much surface area is all wrinkled up in our lungs. Each alveolus is lined with a three-layered membrane called a surfactant. The surfactant reduces surface tension so when the air comes into contact with it, it sticks. And instantly, carbon dioxide and whatever, and, and whatever else is in our bodies might rush out. The oxygen and whatever else is in the air rushes in. Hemoglobin molecules and red blood cells latch onto the oxygen. And with each beat of our heart, that oxygen is pumped to every cell in our bodies. And when you breathe out, you don't breathe all of the air in your lungs out. If you did that, your lungs would collapse. So about half of the air stays in your lungs even when you exhale. So the point I'm making is you can't draw a line and say air ends here and I begin there. There is no line. It's in us, it's stuck to us, and it's circulating through our bodies. We literally are created by air. We are air. And of course when I breathe out, or you breathe out, very quickly convection ensures that every one of us is breathing the air that was once in your bodies. And if I am air and you are air, then I am you. We are embedded in a matrix of air that circles the planet in a single matrix. And not just with all other human beings, but with the trees and the birds and the worms and the snakes that are all a part of that single matrix. This is a wonderful thought exercise the American astronomer Harlow Shapley performed many years ago. He said, what happens to one breath of air? How do you follow what happens to a breath of air? Air is 98% oxygen and nitrogen. Take it in, oxygen, nitrogen rush into your body. Uh, a lot of the, when you breathe out, a lot of the oxygen never comes back out because that's why we need air every minute for the oxygen. 80% of the air is nitrogen. Some of it stays in our bodies when we breathe out. But 1% of the oxygen, uh, of the air, is an atom or an element called argon. Argon belongs to a class of elements called the noble gases. I thought it was Mr. Noble that discovered them, but no, it's because these uh, uh, elements are so noble, they're so snooty, they don't want to have anything to do with that cheap physical stuff. They don't chemically react with anything. They're inert. They don't mix with any other atoms. So an inert gas goes into your lungs, goes into your body, you breathe it out, it comes right back out. So argon is a good marker or indicator of a breath of air. How many atoms of argon in one breath of air? Shapley calculates 3 times 10 to the 18th. So that's 3 followed by 18 zeros. So you take it from me, that's a lot of argon atoms, right? So if, let's follow then one breath of air that comes out of my nose. Very, in a minute, every one of you is breathing gazillions of argon atoms from that my breath. But of course the door is open back there and eventually that breath will diffuse not only through this room but out across Dayton, across the United States. And according to Shapley, one year later, no matter where you are, because air is a single matrix, 
every breath you take one year later will have about 15 argon atoms from that one breath I took a year before. So on that basis, every breath of air you take has millions of argon atoms that were once in the bodies of Joan of Arc and Jesus Christ. That every breath you take has millions of argon atoms that were in the bodies of dinosaurs 65 million years ago. That every breath you take will suffuse life forms as far as we can see into the future. So air, surely air should be considered a sacred substance. It gives life to us, connects us to all other terrestrial beings on earth connects us to the past and into the future in a single matrix. Air surely should be a sacred substance, which is what it is to Aboriginal people. We, uh, we boast that we're intelligent. We're a clever animal. What intelligent creature, knowing the role that air plays in our lives, would then proceed to use air as a dump for the most toxic chemicals we create and think that somehow it's going to simply diffuse away. We are air. Whatever we do to the air, we do to ourselves. I reckon I'm 76 years old. I reckon at my age, I have taken more than 300 million breaths and filtered whatever was in that breath. Who the hell would ever think we can use air as a toxic dump and not think that we're ending up, going to end up filtering that back into our bodies? You know, I see young couples trying to be environmentally responsible by not driving and you see them with their baby in a, in a stroller. And it just grieves me because the baby's nose is right at the level of the exits or outlets of every exhaust pipe of every car passing by. I wanted to do a poster once with a, with a, a hose coming out of the exhaust of a car into a mask on a baby, so the baby, it was just being pumped right into the baby's body. My foundation rejected that as too radical. But <laughs> basically, that's what we're doing. Because what it, we are air. Whatever we do to the air, we do directly to ourselves. And I've learned that the same applies to earth and water and fire. Every one of us is at least 60% water by weight. And, you know, our bodies don't just have the water and then it stays there. We leak water, right? It comes out of our eyes and our nose and our skin and our, our mouth and our crotch. And we lose water all the time. So we have to keep topping up with water. Do you think this is Dayton water? I mean, water, we, the first lesson I remember from elementary school was a water cycle. Water evaporates, forms clouds, rains on the land, falls down, rain, uh, evaporates. Water cartwheels around the planet. And every, every bit of water that we drink will have countless molecules of water that have evaporated from every ocean on the wor in the world, every, every canopy of forest around the world. That water connects us together just in the same way that air does. Remember, we say we're intelligent. What intelligent creature, knowing that we are water? We're basically a big blob of water with enough organic thickener added. We don't dribble away on the floor. We are water. Whatever we do to the water, we do to ourselves. And yet we treat water as a toxic dump. We are the earth because every bit of the food that we eat to become our bodies was once living. Plants and animals. And most of what we eat were plants. And so we eat plants that grow in the soil. We spray toxic biocides onto the plants. We inject animals with highly potent chemicals and then we consume them. We tear the carcasses of plants and animals apart in our mouths and we incorporate the molecules in those plants and, and animals into our bodies. We are the earth through the food that we consume. We say we're intelligent and look at the way that we treat the earth. And finally, we are fire because every bit of the energy in our bodies that we need to grow, move, and reproduce, every bit of that is sunlight. Sunlight captured by plants during photosynthesis, converted into chemical energy, we then get those molecules by eating the plants or eating the animals that, that eat the plants, and we store that energy in us. And when we need that energy, we burn the molecules and li liberate the energy of the sun. I always tell my kids that's why my mother called me Sunny, because I'm liberating the sun's energy back out 
in, uh, and using that um, to live. We are, the, uh, we are fire. So those are the four sacred elements, earth, air, fire, and water, that I believe must represent, surely, the bottom line. The bottom line are the fundamental elements that keep us alive and healthy. And the miracle of life on earth is that those four sacred elements, earth, air, fire, and water, are cleansed, replenished, or created by the web of living things around the earth. Before there was any life on earth, there was no soil because soil is created by life. There was no food for an animal like us because there were no, uh, all of our food was once alive. There was no water that would be, that I would consider safe to drink because it's life that filters water in the soil in the, in the water cycle. And uh, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. So it's life that creates and cleanses and replenishes the four sacred elements. And to me, those must be the real bottom line. However we live, we must make absolutely sure the way we live does not degrade the four sacred elements or the means by which we get the four sacred elements, the rest of the web of living things on the planet. That is the challenge that we face. But my prime minister says things like, we can't do anything about climate change because it'll destroy the economy. In other words, he says the economy comes the economy is the bottom line for him, and it comes before the very atmosphere that sustains us and keeps us alive. And he displays his incredible ignorance that the very word economics comes from the same root word as the word ecology. Ecos is the Greek word meaning household or domain. I like to think of it as the biosphere. Our household is the biosphere, the zone of air, water, and land where all life exists. Ecology is the study of our home, the biosphere. Ecologists try to determine what are the conditions, what are the principles and laws governing a species' ability to survive and flourish. Not a bad bit of information. Economics is the management of our household or domain. Now, I would have thought any group, any corporation, any government, before embarking on a major program would say, wait, before we do anything, what are those ecologists telling us? Because we don't want to violate any of those conditions or principles or laws. But no, my prime minister elevates the economy above ecology. The economy is the bottom line to him. So this is what we, the challenge that we face. It's a clash of two radically different ways of seeing the world. One way sees the world as a, a, a complex system of interacting organisms and air, water, and soil. And that is what we call a biocentric view. Humans are a part of a much more complex world. The other view posits the economy as our highest priority and sees basically the world revolving around us. We're the most important critter. We're going to manage it all. We're going to take whatever we need because we've got to keep the economy growing. As Hermann Scheer, the German uh, economist who became a politician and was the father of the feed-in tariff that has made Germany's renewable energy program so successful, he said that the, the, cr the challenge for us is not technological. It's not political. It's not economic. The challenge for us is psychological. It's the way we see the world because the way we see the world shapes the way that we act towards that world. So this is, the, this is the challenge. How can we see the world in a different way? For most of human existence, we were nomadic hunter-gatherers. We followed game. We went through the seasons in different places looking for food. We were, uh, we understood for the vast bulk of human existence that we were deeply embedded in nature and utterly dependent on nature for our survival and well-being. The agricultural revolution began in 10,000 years ago, but even up until 1900, the vast majority of people in the world were involved in some aspect of agriculture. And farmers know 
that we depend on the seasons, on weather and climate. They know that certain insects are absolutely necessary for pollination. They understand that certain species of plants take nitrogen from the air and fix it as fertilizer. Farmers know that we are deeply embedded in and dependent on the natural world. So by 1900, there were a billion and a half people in the world. But there were only 14 cities with more than a million people. The vast majority of people in the world lived in rural village communities. As I told the people last night in Yellow Springs, Yellow Springs was the way that people lived for uh, most, of the, most of the time in the, in the past of, of your country, in small village communities. And we understood that nature was what uh, dominated our lives. Come ahead a hundred years to the year 2000. Population increased to six billion. But now there were more than 400 cities with more than a million people. Now in countries like Canada and the United States, over 80% of us live in big cities. So we live, we've become transformed from an agrarian species to an urban species. And in a big city, it's easy to think, well, we're not like other creatures. We're so smart, we invent, we create our own habitat. We don't need nature. As long as there are a few parks where we can go and, and play, who needs nature? I mean, my highest priority in a city is my job. I need my job to buy the things that I, that I want. Now, I happen to be the child of, of parents who came through the Great Depression after 1929, and they taught me, yes, you have to earn money in order to buy the things you need, what they call the necessities in life. Now we think in a city, I, want, I need to have a job to make money to buy the things I want. And unfortunately, there's no limit to what we want. And so in a city, because our jobs become our main focus, it's not a surprise that we switch our priorities then to the economy. And the economy then becomes our highest order. Now, we live in a world that, in which the way we live is dictated by laws of physics, chemistry, and biology. In physics, we know the first and second law of thermodynamics means that you can't build a machine, a perpetual motion machine. It's not possible. We know that you can't travel faster than the speed of light. I know someone's going to say, yeah, but at CERN, they've got something that goes seven kilometers. At That's... Uh, I wouldn't hold my breath on that one, uh, or, or I wouldn't count on that one. Right now I say we're limited by the speed of light. We know that we can't build an anti-gravity machine on Earth. We know those, those are laws of physics, and we live within those principles. Chemistry, there are laws governing diffusion rates and reaction rates and, and, and uh, um, which uh, elements can react and which ones don't. We understand those are, are laws that are dictated by uh, chemical principles, and we live with that. We can't make any kind of molecule that we want. And in biology, we know that we're dictated by our animal nature, that is, bio, as biological creatures. If we don't have clean air, clean water, clean soil, clean energy, and biodiversity on the planet, we either don't survive or we're very sick. These are realities that are dictated by science. Other things, like the boundaries that that surround our cities, our states, or our, 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 our countries, capitalism, the economy, markets, corporations, currency. These are not forces of nature or science. We invented them. And if things aren't working, we, those are the one things that, one of the things that we can change. You know, so, but we've somehow created them into something as if they're a force of nature. You don't... A few centuries ago, people believed in dragons and monsters. I mean, they really believed in them. And if they thought that the monsters or dragons were mad at them, my God, they would sacrifice virgins, they'd throw jewels and gold. I mean, they'd do anything to, to appease them because we really believed in them. Well, today we know that dragons and demons and monsters are figments of the human imagination. Nobody worries about them. But what do we do? We replace them by figments of our own imagination again, called the economy. And by God, we take the economy seriously. Just read the papers, right? Oh, the economy's not looking too healthy today. 
you know, or the, uh, the dollar's rising today and we rejoice or we're depressed depending on these fluctuations. I'm th I talked to a neocon about the market. My God, it's amazing. You say, the market. The market. Oh, yes. The market. The market. Free the market. Let the market do its thing. For God's sake, we invented the market. And now we're bowing down before it as if somehow it's going to be the perfect system. Just let it go. This is absurd. This is absolutely dangerous. The economic meltdown of 2008 showed you what, what's wrong. The Great Depression showed us what's wrong. It's absurd to worship these things as if they are forces of nature. But I want to remind you that in 1944, there were 44 countries that were in the Allied Nations fighting against Germany, Japan, and Italy. And in July of 1944, those nations, Allied Nations, political leaders and economists headed by John Maynard Keynes gathered in Bretton Woods, Maine to hammer out a post-war economy for the world. And out of Bretton Woods, they created GATT, the, the uh, uh, what does GAP stand for? The General Agreement, the Global Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. They invented the World Bank, the Intermonetary Fund, the IMF, and they tied global currency to the American greenback, and it worked. And you think of Japan and Germany, two nations flattened by war, that very soon became two of the dominant uh, economies on the planet. It worked. But Bretton Woods left out nature. We were involved, sorry, how much time did, when, when did we start? Oh, okay, okay, great. Uh, I realized the, the, the terrible uh, oversight of leaving out nature at Bretton Woods. When I was involved in a battle over logging in a, one of the valleys called the Stein Valley in British Columbia, and I met the CEO of the forest company given permission to log that forest, and we stood there arguing our heads off, and finally he said, listen, Suzuki, are you willing to pay for those trees so they, don't, they aren't cut down? Because if you're not willing to pay for them, they don't have any value until someone cuts them down. And that's when I realized, oh my goodness, this guy is right. You see, in our economic system, as long as that forest was standing and healthy, it was taking carbon dioxide out of the air, putting oxygen back in. Not a bad service for an animal like us. But in the eco economic system, that's considered an externality. It's irrelevant to the economic system. It has no value. That forest is pumping massive amounts of water out of the soil, transpiring it into the air, affecting weather and climate, externality. That forest's soils or roots cling to the soil so that when it rains it doesn't er erode into the spawning beds for salmon, an externality. The forest provides habitat for countless species of insects, fungi, birds, mammals and so on, an externality. So all of the things that forest is doing, as long as it's intact, are irrelevant to the economic system. And we only see economic value when someone actually pays money to either cut it down or to protect it. And this is the, the great tragedy of this economic system. It doesn't pay attention to the fact that nature is the source of our, our very lives and livelihood. And we don't pay any account. We say the economy comes before the very air that we breathe that keeps us alive. This, the economy, I believe, is the destructive element that is driving us on this very, very dangerous path. We, um, we let economists create the instruments to tell us how well the economy is going, doing. Right now it's called the GDP, the gross domestic product, which is the value of any money exchange for goods and services. There's something really funny about this. The uh, GDP only adds. Any exchange of money goes into increasing the GDP. We don't ask, why is that money going into the be, being exchanged, you know? Is it to buy guns? Is it to repair or, or make up for a car accident? Doesn't matter. Anytime money uh, moves again, uh, across hands, we add it to the GDP. We have this crazy situation in Toronto, the largest city in Canada. We have the largest nuclear plant, Darlington, next to the largest city in Canada. Now, 
our engineers, we have a Canadian reactor called a Kandu reactor, and they all say, no, 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 we're not like those Russians, we're not like those Americans, our, our system is, is foolproof, don't worry about it. You know, you ever ask, what is a foolproof system? It's a system free of fools. <laughs> the word tells you. Who among us has never fallen in love and lost 50 IQ points? Who among us has never gone to a party, got hammered out of our minds, and come in half hung over the next day? Who among us has never got a cold or the flu and still gone to work the next day? All kinds of things make us all fools at some time in our lives. I put my life into a very amazing technology called airplanes. But airplanes keep falling out of the skies and almost always, if they can find the cause, it turns out to be pilot error. I call it the pilot being a fool and outfooling the technology. There is no such thing as a foolproof technology unless you get rid of the fools as Hal did in the movie 2001 or tried to do in 2001. Anyway, uh, I, want, I want you to imagine that the unthinkable happens and Darlington vents a massive cloud of radioactivity and the cloud floats over Toronto and hundreds of people get sick. Well, guess what? The GDP shoots up. We need ambulances, doctors, nurses, medicines, and no doubt lawyers. All of that adds to the GDP. And then if dozens of people begin to die of radiation sickness, well, that's great. You need hearses, caskets, flowers, grave diggers. All of that adds to the GDP. And then if you tell Darlington, you've got to clean up this mess and it's going to cost billions, that means a huge stimulus to the GDP. Have you ever heard of a nuttier measurement of telling us how well we're doing? than the GDP, and yet every politician and CEO will turn somersaults to keep this stupid measurement, keep, keep it rising. We don't ask, uh, uh, we don't question it. And I think the GDP is a, is a, a crazy, um, and it was never developed to do what, what it's being used for today. But I think the most uh, insidious part of this economic system is the way that we have uh, enshrined the need to grow that economy. Economists actually think the economy can grow forever. It can't. And we now think that it must grow forever or because growth has become the very definition of progress or how well we're doing. Growth by itself is not, what does growth do? Growth is just a description of a system. What's the economy for? The economy is not an end in itself. It's supposed to do things for us, good things for us. But we never ask those questions. We just now think growth is the definition of progress. And growth, nothing in a finite world can grow forever. Endless growth is what cancer cells think they can do in a human body. And of course, it's impossible. Now, I'm going to show you why the commitment to endless growth is the ultimate destructive element. Steady growth over time is called exponential growth. And anything growing exponentially has a predictable doubling time. So if it's growing at 1% per year, it'll double in 70 years. 2% per year, it'll double in 35 years. 3% 24 years. 4% in 17 and a half years. Anything growing exponentially has a predictable doubling time. I'm going to give you a system analogous to the planet. It's a test tube full of food for bacteria. And that's the world. And I'm going to put one bacterial cell in, and that's us and it's going to go into exponential growth. It's going to divide every minute, okay? So at the beginning, there's one cell. One minute later, there are two. Two minutes, there are four. Three minutes, eight. Four minutes, 16. That's exponential growth. And at 60 minutes, the test tube is completely packed with bacteria and there's no food left, okay? So it's a 60-minute growth cycle. When is the test tube only half full? And of course, the answer is at 59 minutes. 59 minutes, it's 50% full, one minute later, it's 100% full. So at 58 minutes, it's 25% full. At 57 minutes, it's 12.5% full. At 55 minutes of a 60-minute cycle, it's 3% full. So if, it, if at 55 minutes, one of the bacteria say, hey, guys, we got a population problem, the other bacteria would say, Jack, what have you been smoking? We've been around for 55 minutes and 97% of the test tube's empty. What are you talking about? 
and they'd be five minutes away from filling it. So bacteria are no smarter than people. At 59 minutes, they go, oh my God, Jack was right. We got one minute left. What the hell are we going to do now? Don't give any money to those economists. Give it to those uh, scientists. And what if in less than a minute, those scientists invent three test tubes full of food for bacteria? That would be like finding three more planets close by that we could start using right away. So what happens if they discover or invent three more test tubes full of food? Well, at 60 minutes, first one's full. 61 minutes, the second one's full. And at 62 minutes, all four are full. You quadruple the amount of food in space and you buy two extra minutes. There is no way that we can escape the boundaries of our planet, no matter how much economists and, and engineers may tell you we can harness asteroids and put stuff on the moon and, and don't believe any of that stuff. That's just garbage. We are stuck in, on Earth. The biosphere is our home and it's finite. And every scientist I've talked to agrees with me, we're already past the 59th minute. So all of the calls for the need for growth, the need for more growth, is saying we must accelerate what is a suicidal path. Now I give a lot of talks to politicians and business people and when they hear me say this, they go absolutely berserk. They go nuts. How dare you say that we're past the 59th minute? Look at our stores, they're filled with stuff. Look at our people, we're happier and healthier, we're, we're living longer. What are you talking about past the 59th minute? I make no apology for what I say. We have created the illusion that everything is all right. This can continue by using up the rightful legacy of our children and our grandchildren. And every elder in this room can tell you how much the world has changed in a single lifetime. And you know that we're leaving a world radically different, radically diminished in opportunity and richness from the one that we knew, all in the name of economic growth. We've got to sit down and start asking some serious questions. What is an economy for? Are there no limits? How much is enough? Are we happier with all this stuff? And then get on with changing the one thing we can change, the human-created things like the economy. We need a new paradigm, a new way of seeing our place in the planet. I know it may be a blow to our ego, but we are not the most important creature ever to appear on the planet. And this, isn't, this is all about us, but all about us and whether we are uh, degrading the very life support systems for our children and grandchildren. That's what it's all about. And we can only deal with it in a serious way if we shift the paradigm from an anthropocentric to a biocentric view. And I'd like to just end with two very personal stories or anecdotes. The first is in the late, in the 1990s, before Hong Kong was going to revert to China, all kinds of people began to send money to Canada and invest in property to get money out of Hong Kong before the takeover by the Chinese government. So I, I've lived in the same house now for 35 years, but uh, back in the 1990s I received a, a letter, a flyer from a real estate agent that said, Offshore money is pouring into Vancouver. Now is a good time to sell your house and buy up. I'd never heard this expression, buying up. I didn't know there was a thing called starter homes, where you start with a home. I thought what you do is you, bu you buy property and you make it into your home. So it kind of pissed me off, I must say, when I got this flyer. So I said, okay, if this guy wants to sell my house, what are the things that I would put down as the most valuable parts of that house for, uh, so when it goes on sale, that's taken into account? First thing I put down is the fact that when we bought the house, I moved my, my, my wife's mother and father. I built a, uh, an apartment up above and moved them into it because he had retired. And for 35 years, my children have had grandma and grandpa upstairs right with them, and I put that down as something very, very valuable to me. I, my father was a cabinet maker, and when Tara and I were first married, he built a kitchen cabinet for our first apartment together. And when I bought this house, I ripped it out and put this cabinet into our kitchen. It didn't fit at all, but every time I use it, I think of my father, and I put that cabinet down. My best friend came out from Toronto one, one year for, spent a week. I was building a fence 
along, we live right on the ocean, and he was building, I was building a fence. He spent several days carving a handle for the gate on that fence. And every time I use that gate, I think of my best friend, and I put that down. And my, uh, my mother died in 1974, and I put my, my mother's ashes onto a clematis plant blooming along that fence that I built. And uh, my niece died unexpectedly, prematurely, and I put Janice's ashes on that clematis plant. And every time it blooms, those beautiful purple flowers appear, and I feel Janice and my mother are there. And I put that down. And these are all things, and I had a much longer list, that have made my house not a property or real estate, but have made it my home. And to me, those are things that are priceless. But on the market, they're completely worthless. And that's another problem with this economic system. The things that are most important to us have no value in that economic system. Now, the other story is that the great, my great teacher, my mentor, was my father. And in 1994, uh, my father was dying of liver cancer. No, not liver cancer. It was... Uh, Oh, I can't remember the name of it, but it was an abdominal cancer. Anyway, it was painless. Uh, he knew he was dying. I moved in to care for him the last month of his life. And this was, to me, one of the happiest times of my life with my father, who was a great, a, a great uh, mentor, my great love in my life. And we talked and we cried, and every night my, mother, my wife would bring the children over and we'd show slides of trips that we had taken together with my father. And in all that time... After he died, I thought about it. He never once said, Dave, you remember that closet full of fancy clothes that I had? Or you remember that 1988 Chev that I bought? Or you remember that house that we had in London on Bruffdale Avenue? He never once, that's all stuff. All we talked about were family, friends, and neighbors, and the things that we did together. And he said over and over again, David, I die a rich man. And that was his wealth, a lifetime of experience of doing things with people that mattered to him. And that was his wealth. And in that, he was indeed a very wealthy man. And I think that we better think pretty hard about what is life all about anyway. What is it that brings us joy? And what is it that we're leaving to our children and our grandchildren? Thank you very much. Thank you for that inspiring and challenging address. Thank you all for coming. I think in the interest of time, uh, we're going to skip the question and answer period tonight, Sorry. which I regret. But I would like to offer Dr. Suzuki this gift uh, in appreciation for his time with us and invite you all to uh, the book signing. Uh, there will be books for purchase, uh, some of the many, many books that Dr. Suzuki has written. Uh, and thank you all for coming again. <laughs>